Good morning, church. Let's suppose that two of your best friends come to you and ask you the following question. We want for you to do whatever we want. Wow, what a request. How would you respond to that? Well, maybe if they're uh, your family members, your wife, your kiddos, your grandkids, or your relatives, it would depend on the relationship you have with them. This is exactly the question that was made to Jesus by some of his closest friends and disciples. Jesus replies by saying, what do you want me to do for you? Imagine, church, what do you want me to do for you? This is like a blank check, okay? Just to put it in context. Well, maybe if you were in that situation, Today, you will say, Lord, please stop this coronavirus. Have mercy on us, Jesus. Or you would say, Lord, I want my wife or my husband to treat me better. Or I want my kids, my children to behave. I want the situation in this emotional relationship that I have to improve. I don't know. Maybe it will revolve around I want, I need, I must like my needs. Rarely, confession time, it will revolve around other people. Well, today we are in the middle of a sermon series that we have entitled, Love Where You Live, Love Your Neighbor, and Change the World. This is an impressive title, but yet it is a practical one as well. More than a title, it is a lifestyle. We have committed to applying some missional practices as we go along week after week. We are basing it on the word blessed so we can remember. Letter B stands for begin with prayer. We know that everything begins with prayer. L stands for listen. We have to listen attentively to what the Lord is doing and we have to join him in what he's doing in his kingdom. E stands for uh, e stands for eat, right? I hope that you applied that last week. You ate a lot. Okay, S stands for serve. That's the one we're going to talk about today. And the last one, S stands for share your story. How are you about serving? We'll be talking about this and we'll be studying one of the most unique conversations between Jesus and his disciples. This conversation shows how selfish and ambitious we are as human beings. It portrays a human perspective of service versus a spiritual perspective of serving other people. This conversation is recorded in different Gospels, but today we're going to call our attention to the Gospel of Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. This is a very unique, interesting, selfish, ambitious, self-promoting conversation. And we're going to study three things, a selfish service, an earthly service, and a spiritual service. As we read the passage, we're going to develop on this topic. A selfish service. We see the request in verses 35 to 37. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let us one sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Wow. (laughs) May the Lord bless the reading of his word. James and John, known as the sons of thunder, they were probably a handful, as many of us, approach Jesus asking him to be allowed to sit with him at the highest positions in his coming kingdom. Given and granted to them, they had part of the theology down. They knew that he was the Messiah and they knew that a kingdom was coming. They had that part right, but then they wanted a position in the kingdom. They were literally asking for three things. They wanted preeminence. They wanted glory and honor that came from being elevated to a throne. They wanted proximity. They wanted to be close to Jesus in the kingdom. 
they wanted to have influence, we are close to Jesus, then, then it has to be good for something. And they wanted power. They wanted authority. They wanted preeminence, proximity, and power. 21st century, the story remains the same. We are egocentric, and we want power, we want preeminence, we want authority. So I venture to say, why is it that they felt the sense of entitlement to really ask such an audacious uh, question to Jesus? Well, the first thing that I can think about is that they based it on the request and the relationship they had with Jesus. They were their closest intimate friends. They were there in the account of the transfiguration with Jesus. They were also somehow relatives of Jesus. You know, Matthew chapter 20 tells us that Salome, their mom, comes into the picture. She comes to ask for the boys. She comes and asks Jesus, I want my boys to be seated at the right hand and the left hand. What do you think about Jesus? So this is a family business now. When Jesus is crucified, we see three women. We see Mary, the mother, the biological mother of Jesus. We see Mary Magdalene, and we see the other woman. This other woman is identified as Salome. This happens to be the sister of Jesus' mom, of Mary. So this happens to be Jesus' aunt. The auntie comes into the picture. That has to serve for something. It has to be good for something. They played the family card there. I don't know if you remember, but my kids will always come to me and say, say yes, dad, say yes, dad, say yes, dad. Please say yes. They don't want you to know what they're going to ask for, but they say, say yes. <laughs> you know, it's basically an ice cream or something. As they grow, it's, it develops to something more complicated and complex. But that's the same immature question the disciples are asking of Jesus. Secondly, I think because they hear about the kingdom and Jesus was promising them that they will rule with him. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So they thought it was the time to ask Jesus about this request. Well, these men had been promised thrones and power and position in the kingdom, but what bothers me about their request is the timing of it. Jesus has just finished telling these men that he's going to Jerusalem to be betrayed, to be rejected, and to be killed. All that these men can think about is climbing to the top of the pile. All they can see is their positions in the coming kingdom. Jesus is about to die for their sins, for our sins. And all they can think about is who is on first. What's in it for me? What's in it for me? What's in it for me? Aren't we the same? We are. What's in it for me, Jesus? This man didn't get the idea. You see, they wanted the crown without the cross. They wanted the glory without the pain. They wanted the reward without having to pay the price. Sometimes I find myself struggling with this as well. So we see... The response of Jesus, recorded in verses 38 and 39. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink, drink the cup that I drink? Or baptize with the baptism that I am baptized with? Arrogant answer. We can. They answer. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink. And be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. Jesus responds by telling them that they, are, they have no idea they are asked what they're asking for. He confronts them by asking them if they are willing and able to experience what he's about 
to experience. When Jesus uses the word cup, he's talking about a life experience. When he uses the word baptism, he's referring to being submerged and immersed in that experience. Jesus is saying, I am about to be immersed in an experience that you cannot imagine. Are you able and willing to go through it? And they said, of course, Jesus, we can. We can, Jesus. We can do that. Wow. The reality comes here in verse 40. Verse 40 says, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. So Jesus tells them that they will experience his anguish and to a degree, they knew that they were going to die. Literally, they all died for Jesus, except for, for John that was excluded and exiled to the island of Patmos. You know, James died first and then John died last, excluded to exile. They didn't know, they, they didn't see the picture that to be in the glory you have to suffer Jesus is telling them that positions in the kingdom will not be given based on selfish ambition, but according to the will of the sovereignty of God. Secondly, we see an earthly service, verses 41 and 42. And in here, we see in this account, the story is, is awesome here. It says, the wrong motives. We see the wrong motives here. We see, when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. When the rest of the disciples heard about what James and John were up to, they became indignant. Perhaps they were angry because these fellows were trying to promote themselves over the rest. I wish that would have been the story, but it wasn't. Instead, they were angry because James and John beat them up, you know, to, to that. Beat them to the drew and asked Jesus first what a selfish ambition they had. The reaction to James and John was no better than the request that James and John had made. You know, the ten heard that James and John Asked Jesus first, and they said, why didn't we do it first? I imagine the conversation. I like stories because we learn stories since we grow up. I'm Hispanic. I was told so many stories. So many stories. So I like the stories. And, and you know, I remember my, my dad and my mom telling me the stories. I, 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 I just pictured the disciples having an argument. Why? Why didn't didn't occur to us to do that first. Whoa, I had the idea. You had the idea. I didn't hear you. Oh, no, yes. Remember, we were talking about it. But you never, you never acted on it. And James and John, you know, they were bold to do it. Sons of thunder. God's will for us is to have humbleness and forgiveness. I remember when I was coming here for the first time and interviewing with Pastor Rodney and Pastor Jeff. One time they asked me these questions. Well, Rolando, what's the difference between confidence and arrogance? <laughs> That's a good one, right? Well, confidence is that you can do the only job you can do because Christ allows you to do it and Arrogance is just taking God out of the picture. That was my answer. I don't know if I had it right or not, but they hired me anyways. Because people in this church is humble. And I say, good. I like that. I like that. That's the way of Jesus. We want power. You know, if you look at church history, when the church has been at the center of the story and they have taken Jesus out of the picture, when they have taken Jesus out of the story, out of his story, when we have tried to manipulate, when we have tried to do things in our own effort, we have made many mistakes. 
because the power of Jesus comes through surrender and the Holy Spirit and depending on God's word and his authority. We don't want worldly power. We don't want the wrong example in verse 42. You know, Leslie Nevergen says, we must live in the kingdom of God in such a way that it provokes questions for which the gospel is the answer. We are to live questionable lives. People could look at us and say, oh, I, I, I want what that person has. I don't know about that person, but I have just asked myself, what is it with this person? They have something different. That's the gospel. The wrong example is found in verse 42. Jesus called them together and said, you know, less than time, disciples, Okay. Rabbi Jesus is convocating, convening to a class. Come. You didn't get it. Come. Lesson time. Rabbi Jesus is going to talk. You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. The world is never a good model for us to follow. We cannot be conformed to the pattern of this world, but we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Then we'll be able to test and approve what God will is for us. His good, perfect, and pleasing will. Jesus doesn't allow his anger to come. In fact, he's teaching them a lesson once again. He addresses the issue at hand and and he tells them, this pattern, this model, is not the one we must follow. We need to follow the pattern of service. It is not the path to greatness in the kingdom. It is not self-promotion. The path path to greatness in the kingdom, it is self-denial. Conclusion. (laughs) It is not self-promotion. It is self-denial. He wanted his disciples to understand, and he wanted us to understand as well, that God has a higher goal for us, for his children. So he comes and he talks about a spiritual service. In verses 43 and 45, we see the spiritual expectation. We see the climax of the story. This is it, church. Not so with you. That separates. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become the great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. This man didn't get the message first. And most of us, sometimes we don't get it the first time. We need to be reminded The Lord wants us to know that the path to the top leads through the bottom. The path to greatness is self-denial. If you really want to reach the top, you must start out at the bottom. Jesus uses two words here. The word minister in verse 43 is the word that gives us the word deacon, diaconos. The word speaks of a person who serves others, a waiter, cleaning tables. That's what it means. The other word is the word servant, is the word doulas in verse 44. That word means slave. We are to become servants and slaves of our master, Jesus Christ. That's the idea. If we want to be recognized, respected, we must give up all of our ambitions and selfishness. We must live out our days by serving others. In fact, Jesus... It's just restating a lesson that he shared with them before. You know, this was kind of the hot topic for them to talk about because in Mark chapter 9, the previous chapter, he's correcting them. He's telling them, when Jesus was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Again. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be the first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. 
Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me doesn't welcome me, but the one who sent me. He used a child to teach them about service. Why? Well, first, I think of several reasons, but back in, in the day's society, you know, in the first Mediterranean world century, they were battered. Children were at the bottom of the social ladder. They were viewed as mere property and ignored. Second, he used a child to teach his disciples about service because children really can't do anything for adults when they're babies. They can't. They can enhance a person's position. A child cannot add to your success unless he's a Gerber child that is producing money, but that's just one in a million. However, a child can teach us much about service. Think about it. Every parent, grandfather in this room, knows what happens when a new baby arrives. The child demands everything from us. From day one, all the needs must be met by an adult. And if they're not met, they let you know by a crying, louding, cute sound that becomes irritating, <laughs> right? Demanding. You know, when a child is born, you give and you give and you give. When that child grows, you give and you give and you give. And when you die, everything you have goes to them. <laughs> it's about giving. So Jesus, going back, I like stories. <laughs> He goes back and he tells them, you leave little children like this, you see them? Well, that's service. Do not serve expecting something in return. Serve because you're willing to serve. That's the way of Jesus. That's the path to greatness in the kingdom of God. If you're looking for respect, learn to serve. People who are respected are people who serve. I love this church because my first interaction with this church was a few years ago, about 15 years ago, serving in the colonias of the Rio Grande Valley. This guy translated for some of you on a BVS. You don't remember me. I was younger. I translated for you in a BVS, and, and we had a great time, and we were, we were playing with the kiddos, and then after that, we went to help and, and build a house. I think it was in Peñitas, and... Who would have thought that 15 and 16 years after I would be preaching from this pulpit here? Because this church in North Dallas is not known because it's affluent or it's located in poor cities. This church is known because serving is the best representation of our Jesus Christ. Don't you get excited about that? You should say amen. amen. Thank you, church. <laughs> yes. That's what this church is all about. You know, Jesus is our master. I seen this church serving a couple of weeks ago. I saw some of you calling and say, why do we do? We need to do something. I remember you all brought some blankets and food and milk and, and rice and beans and water. Some of you came on your trucks and wanted to bless the Vickery community, the, the Buckner uh, Family uh, Center in Backman Lake. I saw you, church, distributing tacos. I saw you, church, distributing blankets. That's what it's all about. We are doulos. We are servants of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, our Lord Jesus, he had an ultimate example of service. Our Lord Jesus denied that he was going to be betrayed and he was eating with his disciples he had a good time with them. They ate together. And he did something to exemplify it, the ultimate example of service. I'm going to call Brother Jack Martin to come here. He's going to personify some of the disciples that were with Jesus. You know what Jesus did? In case they didn't get the picture of serving others, Jesus... Taught to his disciples about service, showed them the way. 
but he wrapped a towel. Remember in those days, to go and eat with somebody, they had doulos, they had servants that would be at the door to just wash the disciples' feet or whoever would come in the house because there were dusty roads and their feet were dirty. Not like Brother Jack, you know, he has good feet. <laughs> they were filthy. You know, Jesus was looking at perhaps Peter. <laughs> Remember Peter? Peter said, I will never deny you, Lord Jesus. I will die for you. And a few hours after, he will just deny him. And he was just looking at him. Say, Peter, I know you're going to betray me. I know you're going to deny me, Peter. But I love you with an unconditional, never giving up type of love. I love you. I love you. And I'm washing your feet not because they're filthy, dirty. It's because your heart will be cleansed. Your heart will be restored. Peter, I love you. Perhaps when he was looking at James, and John, sons of thunder, they were later called the beloved. They were changed. They were transformed. Perhaps he was looking at them and he was loving on them. I know you asked me to be seated in the right hand or the left hand. But you know what? I'm going to use you. Regardless of your egocentric Regardless of your selfishness in your heart, I will use you. I will use you. Not because you deserve it, because I love you. I came to be a servant and I'm washing your feet. Maybe Jesus was thinking about Judas, the traitor, and he washed his feet. Judas. I love you. Judas, I know that you will sell me for a few coins in a few hours. But you know what? I came as a doulos. I came as a servant. And I love you regardless of your past, of your present, or your future. I'm venturing to say that after he finished, he probably gave them a hug. I'm COVID free, okay? And he loved on them. Jesus served with passion. Jesus served with sacrificial love. Even to those who will betray him. The ultimate price of service was extremely high. It was his life. His very own life. In few hours, those who he ministered will leave him alone. That's you and me. However, the picture doesn't end there. Luke 18, 14 says, For those who exalt themselves will be humble, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Peter learned the lesson. When inspired by the Holy Spirit, he writes, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he might lift you up in due time. Church, the way to greatness is not self-promotion, is not self-ambition, it is self-denial. What do we do, church? Let us serve unselfishly. Find ways this week to, to serve people. That's the purpose of our existence. Let us serve 
sacrificially. It's going to cost us. It's going to be messy. It's going to be hard. It's going to take us out of our comfort zone. Yes, it will. Let us love as we serve lovingly. We do not serve as the people serve. We serve as Jesus did. And the Bible said here in verse 45, for the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Church, all those online, can we love as we serve? Can we do that? Let us pray. Oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth and the heavens declare your glory and the glory came through Jesus Christ. He came to exemplify what service is all about. He came in a manger, in a stable, to exemplify meekness, humbleness, ruling from the heart. And Lord, because of that service, we are now included as part of the family of Christ. Thank you for that love. Perhaps today is the first time that you hear about the good news and, and the Lord has spoken to you. Maybe you are tuning in online and you want to start a relationship with Jesus. You want to be restored. So you can start today. And you can say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I'm sorry for my sins. And today I received the gospel the gift of eternal life. I acknowledge that you came to die for my sins to give me eternal life. Perhaps you already done that prayer, but you are walking with Jesus. You have fallen time after time and you feel that you don't deserve to come and serve. And Jesus has reminded you today that he loves you and he tells you today, I forgive you and I love you. Lord, I pray for this church. I pray for those online. I pray for the decisions that are being made at this time. I pray, Lord, that you strengthen the hands of those who are servants, serving. I pray, Lord, that you continue to bless those who feel like they cannot serve. And Lord, Find us faithful as a church. Lord, your will, your kingdom, nothing else, nothing less, but your kingdom in our hearts and in our lives. That's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.